In this video, we will be taking a look at one of Cisco Meraki's newest products to be added to its portfolio, the Cisco Meraki Vision, abbreviated MV. This line of security cameras was announced and launched in September of 2016 and started shipping soon thereafter. This product line got a lot of attention and made ripples in not just the networking market that the existing Meraki portfolio fits, but now also turn heads in the physical security space. What the Meraki product management team saw was an opportunity to solve a lot of customer problems in their existing security camera deployments. There were complexities and difficulties with familiar areas, including but not limited to the overall deployment, configuration, and operation. All of these are areas that Cisco Meraki products have experience and successes in solving through simplifying technology. We chose to really focus on the hardware design to reduce the installation and deployment time and each version and build of the product will continue to improve, mature, and evolve the product features to be more robust and comprehensive. There are two models, the MV21 and MV71. The two cameras are electronically and optically identical. They record at 720p resolution through their 5 megapixel sensor. It is a very focal camera with a flexible field of view, which defines how wide or how zoomed in the image is. The included IR illuminators can project and light up approximately 100 feet. Both cameras operate on PoE as the only method of power draw. There is only one cable going in and out of the camera. There is 128 gigs of solid state memory on the camera that leads the industry in terms of memory endurance, the repetitive read and write, and it projects to last well beyond the lifetime of the product. The video itself is stored on the camera, fully encrypted, never in the cloud. And we'll talk about that implementation shortly. While the 5 megapixel sensor is actually capable of 1080p resolution, 720p with a bit rate of 765 kbps and 15 frames per second results in 14 days of video retention with another preset bit rate of 530 kbps and 8 frames per second, giving up to 20 days of retention. The biggest differences between the MV21 and 71 are the weather and vandal proof housings of the MV71, IP66 and IK10 ratings. The MV71 also draws a bit more power as it requires 802.3AT, or better known as PoE Plus, which has, power, which has a power consumption of about 22 watts. Both models have a three-year hardware warranty with advanced replacement through Meraki support. With traditional physical security camera deployments, the network video recorder, or NVR for short, and video management software was always one of the biggest challenges. They were unreliable due to disk failures or hard to use and manage just through the management of the operating system. The MV solution is deployed in a fashion that we call edge architecture, where video is not stored in the cloud. We want cloud where cloud makes sense. And this is not viable when there is a high quantity of cameras, all recording at 720p HD quality. This is also an issue and limiter when dealing with data sensitivity, privacy, and compliance regulations in certain industries. So where do we actually leverage the Meraki cloud? Well, we leverage it for the same advantages as the other Meraki products. We take advantage of centralized control, the single point of management, 
pre-staging and always available configurations, visibility into the operational uptime of the infrastructure, and finally, the storage of configuration and management metadata. Again, this MV Edge architecture really drives home Meraki's reputation as a leading expert when it comes to distributed computing technology, user experience design, and cloud management. We use the cloud to eliminate complexity of highly distributed file storage of videos. The on-device storage eliminates the need for a central NVR storage server array and the expenses that come along with maintaining that software. What does this mean for the end user and our customers? Well, it translates to a reduced OPEX and CAPEX of the physical security solution deployment. This whole edge architecture and backend infrastructure is seamless and transparent to the end user. Should there ever be an interruption in the network, and we're talking about between the camera and the Meraki cloud due to something such as an ISP outage, as long as the MV camera has power, it will continue to record. Once that connection has been repaired, it will continue to be accessible via the Meraki dashboard, where the end user can proceed to operate the MV through the viewing of a live stream or viewing and searching through the recorded footage. The video streams are loaded directly in dashboard, and we recommend utilizing a modern browser such as Chrome that is capable of decoding H.264 videos. As the end user, you are not aware of the decisions and communications taking place between the camera and dashboard that optimizes the overall experience. Should the workstation that is accessing the dashboard be detected to have a direct IP route to the camera, the video will actually be delivered to the dashboard without traversing the WAN or hitting the cloud, resulting in a much lower latency feed and ideal path selection. All transport is conducted over HTTPS. The packets never travel unencrypted. If a local connection cannot be detected, we create an automated cloud proxy to access a video stream of the camera. When it comes to tiled displays of various camera feeds on a large screen, the Meraki dashboard fulfills this checkbox with ease. Each custom arrangement of video streams can be laid out to accommodate user preferences and saved to be shared between users within dashboard. There is a limitation to the number of streams that each MV video wall layout can simultaneously display, 12. However, there are no limitations to the number of web browser tabs or sessions as long as you have a machine powerful enough. The MV solution does not record based on motion or any pre-configured motion trigger areas. It does something even more comprehensive and better, and that's through the feature known as retroactive motion event search. Lots of vendors in the physical security industry records only when something happens. Our approach is to record 24 seven an index of data for effective and efficient search. 99% of the video that is typically recorded is never watched. But how do we find that 1% of useful, interesting footage? Well, we do this by selecting an area of interest to forensically analyze and pull the history of motion event metadata triggers. Once the point of interest has been found, it is a simple process to export the video clip from the camera to be shared with relevant parties. A downloadable link to the exported file can be generated and easily shared. There is often a need to allow different users access 
but with tailored controls appropriate for their particular roles. For example, a receptionist needing to see who is at the front door does not need full camera configuration privileges or even the ability to export recorded footage. Another advantage that role-based access and the web browser-based dashboard provides is instant access. Gone are the days of waiting for law enforcement officials to show up on site to collaborate with the security team. Preposition a dedicated dashboard account configured with proper read or write access to be quickly emailed to emergency responders for them to immediately log into the dashboard from anywhere they happen to be and from their own client workstations. In summary, the MV solution offers a managed service portal with no infrastructure investment. It leverages Meraki's innovative GUI-based dashboard management tools to bring the same benefits to the video surveillance world. Things such as zero touch de deployment and configuration, remote troubleshooting, managed distributed sites, centralized software updates, and administrative alerts round out the advantages of integrating the MV solution into your network stack. This system provides IT and security teams a peace of mind that the infrastructure is not only secure, but that it will continue to meet future needs as it grows and scales with the organization. Thank you for watching, and this concludes the Meraki MV Security Camera section of the Cisco Express Networking Specialization Training. Hello, in this video I'm going to show you how to demonstrate the Meraki MV cameras using the Meraki dashboard and the standard demo network. My name is George Bentink and I'm the product manager for the MV camera portfolio. And so let's begin this process of understanding how to demonstrate not only Meraki but also the MV camera to a customer. So the first thing you should probably sort of get the customer familiar with is this idea of everything being in a single pane of glass, everything being in dashboard, this one management interface for all your IT needs. It could seem strange at the beginning to think about having your EMM, so your enterprise mobility management, managing your Apple devices, pushing apps to your iPad, uh, sort of setting the Android for work configuration on your latest Google Pixel phone and in the same interface with the same login and the same look and feel with no need to go and do additional training or to uh, read manuals and instructions, you can control and manage your physical security infrastructure such as your cameras. This is how Meraki can become sort of the one-stop shop for the lean IT organization. And you can see that on the left-hand side, this sort of navigation pane in dashboard shows us all of the products that we have available. Now, if I go into cameras here and then I click on monitor and cameras, this will give me a list of all of the cameras. And uh, you can see if we've had any problems on the cameras, you see the cameras would show offline. Uh, you can see if they're online, they're green, and you can see their connectivity over a period of time using the red bars. Now, if I was to just very quickly go over here, it says wireless, and we click on access points, you'll see that we have almost an idea identical looking page. All that we've done is we've added a few more uh, columns to this particular table, which we could also do for the cameras to give us the specific information we're interested in for this network. So you don't have to go and learn a whole load of new things to move between one product line and another. One skilled person can manage all of these different things. It's very easy to overlook this and for this to just be an assumed uh, thing, but it's worth pointing out to customers. And this video is about how you explain the benefits of MV and the Meraki dashboard to customers. So really, I like to start off by explaining some of the core concepts of the Meraki philosophy, simplicity, ease of use and management, and how it's highlighted in how you use dashboard. So another good example of that is if I go back to uh, cameras here and we go into cameras under monitor, I can uh, add another column and I'm going to go down to the one that says Ethernet LLDP. And if I do that, you see it has some information about the switch that 
it is connected to or this particular camera is connected to. Now, if I click on this, it's going to go out. And if this is a marquee switch in my dashboard, it's taken me not only to the exact switch, but to the exact port on the switch that that camera is connected to. And we can see the traffic on that switch and various other configuration and operational pieces of information. This end-to-end -end troubleshooting is so powerful. You can even see the, the reverse here is showing the Meraki MV21 cloud managed indoor HD dome camera is attached to this port and how much power it is consuming. So this is really of high value. It's very easy to troubleshoot. And the way I like to describe it is a self-documenting network infrastructure. Time and time again, I've worked in environments or spoken to customers where their documentation was out of date the minute they wrote it. And you need to have very sort of strong practices to ensure it's kept up to date. Well, why don't you take that effort, all the effort that went into the documentation, which is critical, and have the network, have the infrastructure self-document because all the information is automatically collected and kept up to date for you. Another great example is if I go in here and I look at some of the things such as our topology. Now, unfortunately, this might not render particularly well inside my small resolution that I'm recording this particular demo at. So do bear with me. Uh, but you can see that we have our core switch and some of our other switches. And if I expand this uh, a number of levels, instantly you can see it collapsed not only another tier of switches, but also the other connected devices. So we've got Meraki access points, we have Meraki telephones, and we have the cameras as well. And so you're not having to go and draw these diagrams which go out of date in Visio. This is automatically connected and delivered for you. And should you want to print this out on your large format printer to stick on the wall, you can do so with the buttons up here. So some of the basics are more than just basic. They're just really useful day-to-day -day tools that it's easy to take for granted. So if we dive into the cameras a bit more, uh, let's go and have a look at them specifically. So if I wanted to demonstrate uh, the MV cameras to a customer, I normally start on this page. I find it normally works well to tell a story where you are explaining the use of the camera in a particular scenario and start off with something relatively basic and then build on that. And so we have a number of cameras in this uh, particular network. You see we have 46 and they're deployed in different parts of uh, the office. And if I hide my ethernet information here and instead um, I'm also going to hide the MAC address just so uh, on this small resolution I'm using we can see things a little more clearly and I use tags. You can see that I have deployed these cameras with some tags to help me understand where they are and we can very quickly search through those. So if I type fourth we saw all the cameras on the fourth floor. Instantly, without pressing enter, I have a list of all the cameras that are available. Or maybe I want to see all the ones that are at an entrance. So I can type entrance, and now I have all of the ones at an entrance. Uh, maybe I'm just interested in the cameras outside. And so here we have all the cameras on the exterior of the building because I have tagged them with the word outside. This is really, really powerful. Okay, I have 46 cameras here, which is not a small number, but it's not a huge number either. Imagine if I had a whole campus, uh, a university maybe with 600 cameras, this very quick way of finding the cameras that are of interest is really, really powerful. Now, in the demo, uh, there are some cameras that I'm going to recommend that you use primarily for the demo. Now, we do have some in here that are called the uh, coffee bar. Now, if you're watching this video and you've previously demonstrated the coffee bar cameras, these cameras are going to be going away shortly or they may already have left the dashboard by the time you watch this video. And so these are no longer recommended for the cameras that you should be demonstrating. The ones that I recommend are a new set of cameras that are in our bike room. So if you type the word bike, you can now see all the cameras for our bike room. And we have them deployed in various instances. And these compared to our coffee bar cameras set up in a sort of true surveillance or security deployment. So in a way where you would want them to be like that for protecting your bicycles and the entrance and exits of the building, rather than protecting your cookies at the coffee counter from someone taking them while your uh, back is turned and you, know, you, you have no chocolate chip cookies left. So this is a bit more realistic in terms of how people can interact with the system. So if I go click on one of these cameras, it's going to take me into this one particular camera. 
Now you can see I have the camera name and it says stream starting and we have a sort of uh, grayscale uh, image at the background representing the view that that camera has. And now the camera has loaded. Now because we are not local to this camera, we are remote from this camera, we have a little icon here that says cloud stream. And so that little startup, that little spinning wheel and where it says stream starting is the process of us dynamically creating a cloud proxy for your video stream. So what does all of this mean? Well, if you've watched one of my other presentations which talks about the architecture, we deliver video to customers that request video in dashboard the most efficient way possible and they don't need any sp special form of internet connection. So what I mean by that is if you are local to the camera, so you're on the local network, you can access the camera directly, so it's available via its IP address, then we will stream video directly to your browser on your client device from the camera without any use of your WAN at all. And this is all done automatically and it's all done via HTTPS, so all your video stream is encrypted and you get video and it's delivered really, really quickly. But what if you were remote? What if you were at home? Maybe you're in a different office. Maybe you don't have a network connection to that site. Maybe there is no VPN. How do you get access to the camera? Well, because everything is in dashboard and you can access dashboard from anywhere, it wouldn't be a really good user experience if you loaded dashboard and it said, uh-uh, no video for you because you don't have access to the camera. So what we do is we automatically determine if your device has access to the camera. If it doesn't, then we create a dynamic cloud proxy. What happens is we then send the video from the camera to the proxy and connect your client device to the proxy and we bridge you video. And this doesn't need any special configuration. This is all automatic and it's all encrypted. So there is no longer any need for a VPN to be able to access cameras at a remote site where you don't have access to that network. This is incredibly simple architecture provides the best possible experience for customers because it just works and the underlying mechanism is transparent to them. It's also secure and it uses the most efficient way it can to deliver you video. In this instance, because I can't access that camera, I have the cloud stream. So here I am, I'm looking at my cloud stream and I have video in my browser, great. But one of the really important things is that there is no software plugins at all. Again, a lot of the things about the MV camera that make it really simple and easy to use are things that we've taken away, not things that we've added and made it transparent to the end user experience but underlying that is a lot of engineering work by the team here in San Francisco. So there are no plugins, there is no ActiveX controls, there is no Flash, there is no Java app that you have to install, there is no software executable. We use the latest web technology for delivering video to stream you encrypted secure video with nothing to install. You can take a brand new computer with a modern web browser such as Firefox, Chrome, uh, Internet Explorer, Microsoft Edge, Safari, Opera, and you can get video without having to do anything else. So we're, we're looking at the video, that's great, but what if we wanted to look at some slightly different video? Well, I can click on the timeline, and what happens in this particular instance is the uh, camera, uh, the, the browser goes to the camera and says, I want this video. Because we're remote, then the camera sends the video to the cloud and then it sends the video to me. And I can click back in time and each time, uh, you can see we have someone here changing the uh, tire on their bicycle. Uh, we have that video sent from the camera because all the video is stored on the camera. The video is not stored in the cloud and it's sent over the network to me and I view it. And it only sends video over the network when you ask for it. So it's very, very efficient. And so you can go through and you can sort of pick different points in time, you can view different time periods, but you can also use this natural language time picker. So I can say things like yesterday noon and it will go to yesterday at noon and it'll ask for the video uh, from the camera and now it started playing. Or I could say, uh, let's say last Friday 3 p.m. And so it's now showing me last Friday at 3 p.m. This interface is incredibly fast for retrieving video that you want, even though the video is not 
on the computer that you're currently running and it's not on the server, it's been retrieved from the camera. This is really quite incredible. And when we've looked at it compared to some other NVR systems, the traditional network video recorder with video management software, it is as fast and, and often in some cases faster. And the reason for that is that when you scale, you get more resources. So say in a typical system, you have 10 cameras on your server and you add another 10 cameras. Suddenly that server has to do twice as much work and starts to slow down. Well, with the Meraki cameras, you have a camera, it has all the resources it needs. And when you add another camera, it has all the resources it needs. And so it keeps scaling and scaling and scaling as much as you need it to. And so the system never slows down when you scale the size up. So we've, we're looking at sort of, uh, video from uh, back then. I can click now and it will go off to the camera. It will start a live stream rather than trying to take video from the storage on the camera. And we'll get to see uh, live video from the camera as well. And if we wanted to export a particular uh, sort of section of the video, I can press export and I can go down here and I can drag these handles and I can go along and I can say, okay, I want to export this period of time here. So the video is stored on the camera and we don't offload that video from the camera. What happens is the camera keeps recording for the determined period of time. So that's either 14 days or 20 days, depending on the quality setting that you've selected. And when it gets completely full, it starts overwriting the oldest footage and putting in the newer footage. So say an event happens, say my bicycle is stolen in this particular scenario, then I want the footage from that. As long as I go back uh, within the sort of 20 days of my total recordings, I can export that footage from the camera and that footage is exported for me to keep forever. Now I get a file download link. So if I click submit now, I'm going to get an error. Uh, I'm going to get an error because I don't have access because I'm a demo user. So you'll get the same error when you click submit. But what will happen if you're a real customer is you will get an export link and then there will be a little download and you can then save that link and download the file or you can share it with someone else. One of the great things about being able to share it with someone else is that um, you can go in and uh, I haven't got any recent exports on this particular camera. I'll see if I can find a camera with some recent exports uh, where that has been set up for you. But for example, we spent a long time talking to law enforcement about how they retrieve video evidence. One of the problems that they had was that it is very time consuming. They all go to site and they'll try and get the video and there are all these different systems and they may not have the expertise to be able to get the video off or maybe the the user of that system doesn't have the expertise. So then they call a special video retrieval trained officer, uh, possibly to work on getting that video out. And so it makes it very resource intensive to get video for say a relatively uh, low level crime, like my bicycle being stolen, for example. So if you make it much easier for people to get access to video, then it's much more uh, helpful, much less resource intensive to law enforcement agencies to be able to investigate uh, crimes that may have happened. So this gives you a link which you can share with other people and they can then download that file if need be. There are a few other controls I have in here, such as I can full screen this or I can change the time period, but pretty much the most exciting one full stop is the motion search. So if I click motion search, what this allows me to do is, is to select any part of the scene. So I'm gonna go select, uh, say, uh, this part of the scene over here. And I can see what happened in that area at any time in the past. So what happens is because the camera is recording everything and we analyze all of the video at the edge, we can go and find out what happened at any point in time for any part of the scene. So I can go down here and I have the results for what happened at this particular time. Now. I'm going to sort this interface as so we have the time it happened, how long it was, and then we have this thing called ROA, which is region of interest. And so I want to know stuff that happened uh, with a high level of uh, um, sort of alerts there, my region of interest. And we see this sort of gentleman's head has been going through this area. I'm going to explore this for the entire day. So I'm going to go down here and we're going to see this for uh, the entire 24 hour period. Uh, and maybe I want to look um, instead at uh, these bicycles over here. So and I can now go select that area over here and we could go down and say, hmm, maybe what if I click on something like uh, one of these events down here and we can see we have someone coming in and putting their bicycle on the kickstand there. 
So if, say, a laptop goes missing, maybe uh, someone leaves their phone on a work surface and it's not there when they come back, you can go back in time by selecting where that device was or where the device is now and find out what happened. In fact, a good example of it is one of my colleagues uh, left a uh, camera I had given them on a work surface in the office and they came back the next day and found it was gone. And so they went to the to the camera that was watching that work surface to find out what happened to their camera. Sort of a bit of a camera inception thing going on here. And they motion searched and they found that I had picked up their camera and gone and put it in a store cupboard. So rather than watching hours and hours of video, which is highly time consuming, they can do things with a fraction of the amount of effort. So really, really valuable in terms of what they can do. And we can sort of step back in time a few frames here. We can play it again, pause it, and really work out what's going on. And the cameras that we have are uh, two, the MV71, the outdoor camera, and the MV21, the indoor camera. And these are very focal cameras. Both of them are the same in terms of how that works. And so if I go here, uh, we have a... Uh, uh, zoomed in camera so we've used the maximum amount of that very focal capacity to get close up of the entrance door uh, for this particular uh, part of the bike room. So when someone's walking through we want to capture their identity. So there are these, con these concepts in the sort of surveillance world of uh, context and identity. So you want to capture the identity of someone when they come through sort of a choke point like a door or an entrance or a corridor and then you want a, a wider angle shot which gives you the context of what they do. Did they take that thing off that bicycle? Did they put that thing in that cupboard? And so on. But then you also need to know who they are. So uh, I can click motion search here and I'm interested in everything that happened in this area. So rather than selecting an area, I'm just going to click away and it's going to show me everything for the scene. And so now I can go and see, uh, let's go back an hour or so. So I've clicked left here. That's taking me back in time by an hour on the interface. And now I see I have some results. So I can click on this result here. And we can see that we have this blue outline showing the shape of a person. And we have one of the uh, office staff uh, working on uh, the office here. So he's either walked across this way or he's just about to walk back this way. And this is showing uh, the motion that happened uh, because of that. So uh, putting up a sign here about uh, the office. Let's pick another event. Uh, let's pick, uh, oh, there we go. He's just walked back across. So if we pick uh, another event here, Oh, there he is walking up there in the first place. Um, so we go back another hour. And so rather than having to watch that whole hour to see what happened, we can quickly click on an event and see what happened. So we've got uh, someone going out the door there. You can see it's detected all of the door motion. Uh, maybe we'll click this event here. And we have someone taking their bicycle out of the bike room. Is that their bike? Maybe. We don't know. Uh, but we have the video should we need it. And so you see, rather than having to go and do the really boring thing of watching lots and lots of video, I can just so quickly go in and just click the events and find out uh, what happened. Um, it really is such a time saver. Uh, I'm not watching hours and hours of footage. Really very powerful indeed. Okay, so what are some of the other settings if you're doing a demo? So this is a guide for you uh, as someone who works at Cisco to work out how to demo the cameras. Well, if we go here and I click network, this gives us network information. So the standard things such as IP address and so on. You can see I've got these links to the Meraki switches so I can go in and sort of click on the Meraki switches. And also this connectivity information. And so you can see whether or not there's been any downtime, whether the switch has been disconnected, uh, maybe the camera has been powered off. And this is really powerful. Often people don't know if their camera is working or not, or if it had any problems. This type of feedback, this health bar, lets them know very quickly and easily. And you can configure an email alert so that when the camera goes offline, you know when uh, that's happened and you can go check on it. You can then also look to see historically what has happened. You can also put stuff in like the location of where it is. So we've got it on a map. And uh, I'm going to hope I've added a mounting photo. Uh, I haven't in this particular scenario. But you can mount uh, the camera and then take a photo uh, using the uh, mobile app. So in another one of my videos, I'm going to show you how the mobile app works. Now, this final tab, this one called settings, is how you set up the camera. So this is where you can zoom and focus. And we have this lower latency stream for focusing. 
What does that mean? So we have a lower quality video, which responds more quickly to changes on the camera, so you can easily set up the focus of the camera. If I go down here, you see we've got this zoom, I can zoom in, I can zoom out. See, we're zoomed into the maximum here to make the image as large as possible, and I could zoom out over here. Now, because I'm not an admin user, I can't physically make changes. So if I click these buttons, nothing is gonna happen. If I want to focus, I can set run autofocus, or I can focus on a specific area. Again, sort of going and clicking and dragging like I would do uh, with a uh, motion search, for example. Uh, and down the bottom here, uh, we can change things such as the rotation or the aperture on the camera as well. Now, in terms of how long the camera store video, this is where that is currently configured. You can choose to sacrifice a little bit of quality to store things longer. So that's the standard quality here. That's uh, 530 kbps at eight frames a second, and you get 20 days on the 128 gigs on the camera. Or you can choose enhanced quality, so you get some uh, more data and a faster frame rate which is better suited if you've got a lot of fast moving objects. So when you don't have a, a large uh, amount of frames per second or you have a low bit rate, it's not gonna be so suitable to capture a car's moving, for example. So in this case, if you've got it watching a, a street, then you may want to choose this particular setting. The final setting you get to choose is night mode. So these are the defaults. It will automatically turn on when the camera thinks it's dark enough, and it will then turn on in its infrared illuminators, which are effective up to 30 meters or around 90 feet. If for some reason your camera needs adjusting from the defaults, an example may be you have like an external uh, light, like a security light near the camera, which could make it think that it's daytime when it's not, then you can adjust the settings here uh, with these sliders. But typically these don't need to be adjusted at all. And if you want to go look at camera in night mode, it's pretty easy to do that. So we've been looking at the bike room, but if I click back to cameras up here and I clear out my search, and I'm going to go to uh, one of uh, the IDFs. So these are our wiring closets in the Meraki office. Uh, we can see some of the uh, video in night vision mode. And in fact, this is probably a good segue into what is called the video wall. So if I go to cameras and rather than choosing monitoring cameras, I want to monitor the video wall, we can go look at that instead. So we've only been looking at one camera at the moment. Uh, you can look at multiple cameras at the same time. And this is under the video wall function. So here we're looking at a number of our IDFs and these are all completely dark rooms. There is no light in them at all other than the infrared from the cameras. And you can see that we're looking at the, rack, the back of some racks here. Uh, we can see it's looking at the front of some racks. Uh, we can see it's covering the door entrance. So because these are highly sensitive areas, we want to know who comes in. So we get their identity, for example, and we want to know what they change. So do they unplug a cable from here? Do they not? So for example, I could click plus here and it's gonna magnify this particular one. And I could go in and have a look at that. Uh, particular switch. Did they unplug that stacking cable maybe? And then I can zoom back out and it takes me to the rest of my cameras. You can even see we have some uh, uh, Meraki MC phone that's been tested down the bottom here. Uh, so this is what it looks like when you're looking at the cameras in night vision mode. And these uh, video walls, we have a number of them. So if I go to my bike room, for example, uh, you see we've got a, a bike room specific video wall. And these cameras can be anywhere. They don't have to be on the same site. They don't have to be in the same country even. You can set them up. And because of the automatic uh, self-discovering nature of the Meraki MV architecture, these are all cloud streamed directly to me. And I can go in and look at all of these uh, video cameras. Now what's really cool is the timeline and everything works, oh, we've got someone coming in here, uh, works the same way. So uh, when uh, people come in, all of these videos are synchronized uh, together. So when uh, the top video is playing, all the other videos are playing at the same time. So we can see this uh, uh, person coming up here, walking through here, walking around here, and so on. And if we want to go back in time, we can do that and it will go and ask for the video. Again, this video is coming from the cameras. And in this case, because I'm remote, it's coming from the cameras through the cloud to my browser and it's synchronizing all of those in real time. And I can do the th same thing such as yesterday, noon, 
and it's going to go do that for all of the cameras and I can go and again export footage for one of the cameras from this interface should I want to. Uh, we also have uh, another setup. This is another good demo setup uh, for, for you to use if you want to show the cameras in a sort of surveillance setup. Um, so you can see people walking down the stairs. You can get a good sort of uh, close up. So we can go back in time again here. So you can see people walking down the stairs, get a good idea of sort of a very zoomed out camera and a very zoomed in camera. And this is also a sort of bird's eye view. So this makes it interesting because you can go in and sort of start to understand some of the interesting uh, capabilities when you have an uh, unobstructed view. So what I mean by that is you can trace people's patterns as they move across the floor. Uh, so this is where motion search provides like another angle in terms of what you can look at. So if I click motion search, we can go down here and we can look at some uh, different searches. And you see we've got these patterns here of like people walking across. And I, I'm assuming, yeah, there we go. We're going to have another person walking across this way. So this helps you understand the direction where people are going and what they're doing. Um, so we can add another one here. But not necessarily the identity of the person. That's when having a camera uh, with uh, a zoom in at a lower angle to capture their face helps you piece together a complete security story. Now, I want to go back to the video wall because there's something I didn't show you which is super cool. So I'm going to click Edit Layouts here and I'm going to say uh, along the side here, new layout. So again, apologies for the uh, low resolution. This is due to my recording. With your uh, real experience, you'll find this to be much better. But I've created a new layout and it says this layout is empty. Do I want to add some more cameras? And here I have all these thumbnails and uh, I can go in and say, okay, I want to add uh, this one, for example, and the bike room. And I also want to add uh, this coffee bar one and I want to add another one and this outdoor one. And maybe I want to go down here and add uh, this one and this one. So you can have up to 12 uh, individual video feeds per video wall and you can have as many video walls as you want. So uh, if we go back to my new layout here, you can see I've got all my little tiles, um, but I can then expand these. I don't have to have it just like that. I can have a completely custom layout. Uh, maybe I'm more interested in these videos being large. Uh, maybe I don't want this one anymore. And it's creating this completely dynamic layout with no software, all in browser. And what's really cool is you can take each one of these and you can duplicate your browser tab and then you can have multiple video walls running simultaneously and if you have multiple monitors you can have them on multiple monitors. You really you can create a very complicated highly detailed video sort of monitoring server or a computer where you get to see uh, tens or 20 or uh, I think I've had up to about 50 video feeds simultaneously playing back across all of these monitors as you would do in a sort of like a, a security nerve center. So that really is the sort of core of the demonstration. We're talking about how simple and easy it is. The lack of things to configure is a huge benefit. That's what uh, you should be showing. So we're going to go in here and look at one of the last things uh, that I want to show you in terms of configuration, which is the camera only permissions. So typically I want to show the individual cameras, how easy it is to find video at different points in time, the real power of motion search, saving you time, how you export video, then the video wall, and then finally, Typically, people have uh, the need to allow uh, staff in their organization access to the cameras who aren't network administrators. So to do that, you can create specific administrators for um, the uh, cameras. So I'm going to say, I'm going to select Amanda here, and Amanda can view uh, live footage only for only a select camera. And I'm going to select, say, uh, the bike room entrance rack. And so maybe this is someone who's managing reception. Maybe they need to watch the back door or to see if a delivery truck has arrived. They don't need historical footage and they don't need footage to maybe more sensitive cameras in say maybe the cash handling area, but they do have a need for video or you can very easily define a role which gives them access to just this camera. Or I can add another user. So uh, let's add Ben here. 
and Ben can view uh, any footage, both live and historical, but he can't export the footage. Um, and instead, then uh, I can go in and say he can do it by camera tag. So all the fifth floor cameras. And then finally, we could go in and we could uh, pick someone else here. Um, so we could pick Chris, for example. And then I can say uh, Chris can view live, historical and export footage for all cameras in this network. So with these controls, you can very easily provide granular access to the cameras, which is often a strong requirement for customers. Now, if I scroll down here, you can see uh, there's the ability to create alerts and so on for the other products. It is also possible to create alerts for the Meraki cameras, so an email alert should the camera uh, cameras go down. But it's also important to focus on things uh, such as uh, the sort of, uh, security. So I'm going to go in here. I think I need to actually go uh, one further down. I'm going to go to where it says settings. So in the organizations page here, you can set things such as the strictness of the password, password complexity, the need for two factor, and all of these things apply to the cameras as well. So we've heard a lot of news about the mirror botnet. We've heard about insecure IoT devices, cameras, NVRs being hijacked and being used to attack other people. The prevalence of default or hard coded passwords within IoT devices. Well, with the Meraki MV camera, we inherit all the best practices and all of the expertise placed in our network security products such as the MX inside the camera. And so there are no default passwords. There is no hard coded passwords. Everything is encrypted by default, managed for you and cannot be turned off. We have encrypted management, we have encrypted storage and we have encrypted transport. And all of these are default at the box and you can't turn them off. And that is unique within the industry. And I feel this is gonna be a more and more important decision uh, when customers look at buying technology, which is their confidence in the security of it and the likelihood it could compromise their network and IT infrastructure. And with Meraki, you get the best possible camera security platform out the box with no extra work. So with that, thank you very much uh, for listening to my guide to demoing MV cameras. Uh, the one last point I would like to emphasize is if you are demonstrating Meraki MV to customers over WebEx, there is likely to be a significant decrease in the quality of the video that the customer will see and the latency or lag in them seeing video that you're showing through the Meraki dashboard. This is because WebEx has to re-encode the video that's been displayed on your computer and then send it over the network to the other person that's viewing it. This process incurs additional quality loss, it incurs additional delays, and is normally fine for a PowerPoint presentation, but will have quite a significant impact on the customer's experience of your demonstration when done remotely. I highly recommend you set expectations correctly at the beginning of your demo that when they are viewing this, that they are not seeing the real end performance of the system that they would have if they had it up and running. To that, uh, with that in mind, I highly recommend either demonstrating this on, in person with a computer on the customer site, or if that's not available, once you have demonstrated it to them with this caveat, offer them a trial where they can try the cameras directly for themselves.